If you're like us, you've probably seen references to something called Munchausen's by proxy and been curious without really understanding what it is or how it may affect people. That's why we were excited to hear about the new podcast, Nobody Should Believe Me. The host, novelist Andrea Dunlop, takes an in-depth look at this subject. No one has ever done this before. She talks with people who have been affected by this condition. She even speaks with a perpetrator. We've already listened to the first two episodes, and we can tell you that Andrea doesn't dwell on the darkness. She takes great pains not to be gory or exploitative. This show has heart. It focuses on the humanity of everyone involved. And what makes this podcast extra special is that Andrea has a deeply personal connection to this subject. Someone very close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy. That gives the show a real emotional punch. When Andrea is listening to people tell stories about how they've been affected by this condition, she is not some uninvolved outsider. She has lived through the very same pain they have. She understands them. And through this podcast, she helps all of us understand them too. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. We get support from Audible. We've all got busy schedules. And I'm sure sometimes you feel like with all the things you have to do, it's hard to find time for the stuff you love to do, like reading. That's why Audible is so great. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. Plus, as an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. And also, I have to say, I love how the Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, when you're traveling, working out, walking, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. Cleaning the bathroom has really never been more fun. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500. That's audible.com slash listening or text listening to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash listening. Ever wasted a little too much time trying to be more efficient? No judgment. We've all been there. The good news? Monday.com helps your organization save time and achieve more. With just one work platform, you can keep every department in sync, improve your workflows, and cut out repetitive tasks to reach your goals faster. Let's not lose any more time. To nail efficiency, start your 14-day free trial at Monday.com. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder. It was a little before 2 p.m. on April 8, 1992, and Robin Fuldauer was not answering the phone at the Payless Shoe Store where she worked as a manager in Indianapolis, Indiana. That wasn't like Robin. The 26-year-old was a good and conscientious worker who took her responsibilities seriously. But her district manager tried not to worry. Robin, after all, was alone that day. She was running the entire store herself. Perhaps there had been a rush of customers, and they were simply keeping her too busy to get to the phone. So, he called back a few minutes later, and a few minutes after that, Robin still did not pick up the phone. By now, the district manager had grown concerned enough to take action. He phoned the Speedway gas station that sat next door to the shoe store. Could someone there head over to the Payless and check on Robin, just to make sure she was all right? Gas station employee Lucretia Gullett got the assignment. She walked over to the Payless and stepped inside. She stood in the front of the store and didn't see anyone, didn't hear a sound. But she noticed something. The cash register drawer was open. I didn't want to go back in the back of the store, she told the Indianapolis Star, because I figured something bad had happened. I was afraid of what I might have found. Instead, she phoned the police. Some patrol officers arrived shortly thereafter and crept to the back of the store. There, at 2.21 p.m., they discovered Robin Fuldauer, dead from two gunshots to the head. What no one could have guessed was that what had happened to Robin was just the beginning. 
Over the next month, the same killer would strike again and again, taking the lives of five more people in three different states. And all of these years later, we still don't know who he was or how many other victims he murdered. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders, a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, The Murder Sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout Season 1 to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're The Murder Sheet, and this is Hunting the I-70 Killer, Part 1. Michael Crook, then a homicide detective with the Indianapolis police, hadn't even reported in for duty that day when he got word of what had happened to Robin. Myself and my partner were together. We were actually on our way into the city county building where we report on a daily basis, you know, when we're working. And while we were uh, en route to the office, we heard the incident come out and the day shift people were getting called there and it would be natural for us to take the call so that day shift wouldn't get stuck on a you know for overtime purposes and stuff so uh, myself and my partner responded um, out to the scene now after um, well when we arrived um, there was uh, the uniformed police officers had gotten to the scene up there to uh, put up the crime scene tape and so forth. Even as he arrived on scene, Crook made quick observations about the area around the Payless where Robin had been killed. For one thing, the shoe store was only a short distance from the highway, and there were other shops close by. The the businesses at that time there was a, a and I think it still is. Uh, Matthew's Bicycle Shop, which was directly across the street from the Payless. And to the east of the Payless was a Speedway station. This, of course, was where Lucretia Gullett worked and where she had gotten the request to go and check on Robin. Directly next door to the west was um, a um, gentleman's club. And the Gentleman's Club uh, doesn't open until like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So there wouldn't be anybody around there at that particular time to, you know, to serve as witnesses or even for our, our suspect maybe to have visited beforehand. It just didn't happen. Entering the Payless, Crook noted an odd, bizarre detail. There were a lot of uh, empty shoe boxes on the floor. And these were mostly like child shoes. It was definitely child shoes that that had been taken. And that didn't, you know, originally make sense that someone would come in and, you know, uh, commit this crime and take kids' shoes. But this small mystery was soon solved. Through uh, forensic, I think we were able to get an ID and um, uh, talk to the individual who basically... Um, as ridiculous as this may sound, uh, thought that since there wasn't a clerk in the store that was just free shoe day, and so they just helped themselves. All this time, they didn't realize, of course, that Robin was in the back room. 
other puzzles were not so easily unraveled. Robin was uh, the store manager, and she was not supposed to be alone at the store that day. There was another worker who was supposed to have uh, come into work, but uh, that employee called off sick. Now, for us as investigators, when that happens, it's you know your your radar goes up a little bit, and you're wondering well, why, you know, what was the deal with that, and of course you're wondering if if that call in sick you know, was related to this crime in any way. So naturally we went through the, uh, the process of eliminating, eliminating, you know, other store employees and so forth. But Robin being the manager, that uh, was her duty to stay there. And she had uh, attempted to get other people to come in, but couldn't um, get another employee to come in until later in the afternoon. While there were no other people in the pay less with Robin, the store cash register itself served as a bit of a witness, duly recording not only each business transaction, but also each and every time it had been opened. As near as we can put together then around, I think it was like one twelve in the afternoon was the last cash trans- transaction that took place <clears throat> at the register. Then, And that was some sort of sale of some kind. And uh, then the drawer was opened again at uh, 1.31 p.m. So that last time that drawer was opened, we know the uh, suspect was in there at that particular time. Despite the open register drawer, Robin's murderer did not seem especially interested in taking much of anything from the store. Here's Michael Crook again. One of the things I can add at, at this point, and this kind of goes for all of these cases, is that robbery or the taking of any kind of money or other property uh, is not the primary motive because in some of these cases, uh, there was sizable amounts of money that was left. Many things, of course, have changed in the 30 years since Robin was murdered. In many ways, detectives of today have more tools at their disposal to investigate crime. But the detectives of 1992 did have one distinct advantage when it came to locating witnesses. We didn't have the abundance of credit card use like you do today where you're swiping everything. And uh, so you you just didn't have a lot of transactions through credit, credit cards, but people would write a lot of checks and so forth. So we had a number of checks in there, which, um, Uh, we were able to contact, you know, the individuals who had uh, made purchases up there during the day to see if they had seen anything. We wondered if these efforts had paid off and asked Crook if there was a witness in Robin's case. I don't want to, I don't want to say we don't have a witness. Uh, We just don't have a very good witness in, in ours, in our case. So, um, the the witness in our case was so far away that they really couldn't uh, provide a description or anything like that for us for us. So um, so yes, we have a witness, but virtually uh, could offer really nothing that would be uh, helpful in the in the solving this particular crime. As Crook and his team continued to investigate in Indianapolis, unbeknownst to them. Robin's killer had moved on, traveling to Wichita, Kansas. On April 11th, 1992, 23-year-old Patricia Smith and 32-year-old Patricia Majors were staying late at the La Bride de Elegance bridal shop. A customer had asked if he could come in to pick something up after hours. Patricia Smith was the... uh... Uh, employee and Patricia Majors, who was the other, the second victim. Uh, Majors was the owner of that particular uh, shop. And uh, Miss Majors uh, was there uh, for the purpose of closing the business and counting the money and helping uh, uh, Patricia Smith lock up and so forth. Uh, So she wasn't even supposed to have been there. When a man showed up at the closed business sometime after 6 p.m., they let him in, 
assuming he was their customer. But he was not. He was instead the same man who had murdered Robin Fuldauer just a few days before. Now, he forced Patricia Smith and Patricia Majors to the back of the store and shot them both in the head. And then he heard something. He left the front door open and someone had entered the store. It was the woman's customer, the man who had made plans to meet them there. Michael Crook takes the story from there. This individual had walked in and was confronted by the suspect who tried to um, talk him into going into the back room as well. But, uh, it was a gentleman who was there to pick up a cummerbund that, from a tuxedo rental that he had gotten earlier in the day. And when, uh, when his, his wife was outside and she was sitting in a vehicle and she seen her husband throw his hands up like, you know, she thought it was a security guard. So she bolted in there and, and was ranting, you know, what the heck's going on? He just come to get his cummerbund. And at that particular moment, our suspect kind of lost control and both of them ran out the door and, and then he exited as well. He being the suspect. But the witness had gotten a great look at the killer and was able to provide a description. He said the murderer was white, with red hair, and about five foot eight. He weighed somewhere between 150 and 160 pounds. He had a stubble beard and wore a brown jacket and dark slacks. The witness also stated that the suspect carried an Uzi like semi automatic weapon. Lieutenant Paul Dotson of the Wichita Police told the Wichita Eagle that the experience had been traumatic for the witness. The customer was very confused and frightened by his ordeal, said Dotson. There's a certain degree of guilt, as you can imagine, and also some relief that he was not found dead in the back of the building. Michael Crook makes another crucial point about this double murder. And let me let me just also mention that, that the the bridal shop, there was quite a bit of money that was left on the scene there and clearly visible. So if a person wanted to, if it was solely for the purpose of robbery, there was a lot of money left behind, which again makes us uh, believe that robbery is not the main focus of this. It's the, you know, the killing of the women. At this point, the Wichita murders had, of course, not been linked to what had happened to Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis. And meanwhile, the killing continued. Then the next one was April 27th at, uh, in, in Terre Haute. And the victim in this was uh, Michael McCowan. And Michael was uh, uh, working at what his, it's, uh, his mother's uh, shop, which was called Sylvia's Ceramic Shop. And that was just north of I-70 on uh, 44. And it it has uh, it's been out of business for several years uh, as well. Now, bear in mind that our suspect has targeted places in which women would be working and mainly alone. Obviously, McCowan um, wore his hair in a ponytail, and he was uh, down, uh, bent down, or on his knees uh, working on the stocking the shelves uh, there at that ceramic shop when the suspect walked in. And it would be our belief that um, once the uh, suspect realized that he was not dealing with a female, that he was dealing with a male, uh, he shot him immediately and then left. So there wasn't the movement that taking anybody to a back room and, and actually, uh, um, there wasn't really much much space in there to even have done that had that been the, the same uh, procedure that he went through with the others. A little less than a week later, the killer struck again. This time, his target was 24-year-old Nancy Kitzmiller. She was working at um, what is called Boot Village in St. Charles, Missouri. And that was... Um, a business uh, 
that was uh, located in in a uh, strip mall area, which most of these were. She was uh, uh, working alone on uh, on the day that she was murdered, and um, uh, again, uh, she was taken to the back room and shot in the back of the head. Though, of course, investigators did not realize it at the time, there were some strong similarities between this murder and the others. Um, again, lone female working, and he's able to take her to the back room uh, where he uh, shot her in the back of the head. The final victim in this particular spree was 37-year-old Sarah Blessing, who was murdered on May 7, 1992, in Raytown, Missouri. She was working at her own business. That was a store. It's called the Store Many Colors, and they sold uh, a little di- different things, odds and ends. Uh, primarily, it was uh, herbal stuff. It was not, uh, there wasn't any narcotics or weed or anything like that. Although, with that kind of place, you would, you would think maybe narcotics would have been sold there, but that's not the case. Again, it's not a big moneymaker, and not a lot of cash would have been on hand there. And uh... According to news reports, witnesses saw the suspect hanging around the shopping mall that afternoon. And after the murder, he was seen exiting the store, appearing perfectly at ease. Blessing was found inside, lying face down in a puddle of her own blood. All six of these murders took place in businesses not far from the I-70 highway. Thanks to ballistic evidence, we know now that all six of the victims were killed by the same weapon, by the same man. But at that time, it was not easy for investigators in five different communities with five different crime scenes to make that connection. Um, That took a while for us to, to link all these things together. And, of course, back then, um, it sounds like it was forever, but it it really wasn't that long ago, although it's been 30 years this month. Um, We didn't have the cable networks and the social media platforms that we have today, uh, such as your podcast and so forth. So getting word out was was not... uh, we just didn't have that that way to communicate and put this information out to um, let other uh, you know viewers and people know what was going on. It was just the Indianapolis area. Despite what Michael Crook says, it really did not take investigators all that long to link the cases. In fact, they managed to start that process while the murder spree was still going on. It was sometime around or after May 7th, I believe, is when we started kind of connecting things. We had received a call from the St. Charles Police Department. Um, the investigator there had a case that was um, very similar to ours. That, of course, was the murder of Nancy Kitzmiller at a business called Boot Village. From that, when they reached out and contacted me, they were able to bring their uh, evidence were the forensic evidence and uh, being a shell casing and bullet over and then we had our Marion County Crime Lab examiner look at it and uh, did the comparison and and said yes these two are, are definitely fired from the same weapon so that was the first time that we were able to um, you know it's, it's kind of bittersweet because you're, you know, as an investigator, quite frankly, you're thinking, well, I'm not in this alone. I'm going to have some help, you know, from another agency in another city and state. So it's, you're, you become, you're not relieved, but at least you know at that point you're going to have, you know, some, maybe they'll get Uh, better witnesses or something to that effect that would really be able to um, to help resolve it but unfortunately they weren't uh, they weren't able to come up with a good witness um, either one of the early things investigators did was to consider the cases together and see if they could glean any insights from listing the similarities between them the first thing is that you know as i've stated before 
all are females and they're supposed to be working alone. And um, again, cases where there wouldn't be a lot of money that would be taken in these things. Uh, and the money itself, uh, uh, even if there was money available and visible, it just a very minimal amount would have been taken either to make it look like a robbery or to, um, you know, maybe uses it for transportation or food or maybe a hotel or something like that uh, while he was traveling. So the other similarities is that uh, in most of these cases, um, he was able or, um, you know, took, let, let me put it this way. He was calm, uh, manipulative, I think able to basically uh, make the victims feel that they were going to be okay, just go to the back room like I asked. Uh, so he was able to control them and move them uh, without any uh, resistance or anything uh, to get them back there. And then once he gets them in the back room, shot them. The exception to that, of course, was uh, McCowan. Um, and then if, if possible, he always left through the back door. And that certainly um, contributed to the lack of, uh, of witnesses as well. We didn't have like a, you know, you couldn't uh, set your watch by the day or the, the time that you thought these were going to happen, although most of them were early afternoon or, or the late evening, like 6 o'clock there in uh, Wichita. And the fact that um, with these victims being alone in these uh, businesses that uh, also delayed, you know, a police response or somebody finding them. And so they could be there for uh, quite a period of time before anybody decides, you know, that maybe we should look around and find out where the victims are. So that, that delay uh, also helped the individual in his uh, escape. So, the interstate, in particular, when you look at uh, the Payless in Indianapolis, when you go out the back door, you go up a hill and you're on Interstate 465, naturally runs around and into, into 70. The investigators also brainstormed to see if they could find some sort of meaning or explanation in the killer's acts. Another another interesting thing here that... that uh, uh, was suggested by our, our uh, profiler, Larry, was the fact that um, when, bearing in mind that we had Indianapolis and then uh, Wichita and then Terre Haute, so when you look at that, it's like, why, why is this individual traveling, which is still the un- unknown, but why does he come back to Indiana? from that and then as I explained he had a he had somebody walk in on him in that case there so um, did he get flustered and you know it's uh, the the psychology uh, behind this is that uh, um, it is like if you're punishing you know your child and you send them to their room uh, for doing something so it's kind of our belief that um, when things kind of got sideways and, and he lost control there a little bit in Wichita, maybe he had to come back to his home ground area, which is Indiana. It's also interesting to note that Indianapolis is the first one in, that we know of uh, that he, you know, where this all starts. And so that that would tie into maybe he is from Indiana or Indianapolis. Who knows for sure, obviously. The profiler the team worked with also had some advice that we thought might potentially directly impact how we presented this episode. Another thing that, that um, you know, again, based on the advice that we were given uh, from, from our profiler and, and major case specialist, uh, we tried to avoid tagging this guy with the nickname of the I-70 killer, but uh, quite frankly, 
even though uh, we had efforts among our, our you know group of investigators not to uh, try to refer to him as that, it didn't take long before you know media dubbed him as that. And so that again could play to his uh, it could play to his uh, psyche or uh, it could be hurtful or helpful either way. But um, so from that time on, it has become the I seventy killer. Anya asked the obvious question. And do you think it's okay if we call it the guy that the I-70 killer? I know that that was sort of not yeah. what you guys want. At this point, it feels like the cat's out of the bag, yeah. I guess. No, after after all this time, yes. It's, this was in the beginning, what I was talking about there, where you, you don't want to dub the guy a certain mm-hmm. name or something, you know, because that, that can make them feel more important than what they really are, and for the wrong reasons, obviously. Next week, we will continue our conversation about the I-70 killer with former Indianapolis homicide detective Michael Crook. We will discuss the challenges of running a homicide investigation with multiple crime scenes in different states with several law enforcement agencies. We will also cover the possible other crimes the I-70 killer may have committed, including one of the restaurant murders we covered last year a case which has never been publicly associated with this killer before. And finally, we will talk about the intriguing possibility that Harry Edward Greenwell, who was recently unmasked as the I-65 killer, may also have been responsible for the I-70 killings. We would like to thank Michael Crook for talking with us and sharing his direct experience working on this very difficult case. In addition to Michael Crook, for this episode, we also relied on information from the Indianapolis News, the Indianapolis Star, the Wichita Eagle, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, KMOV, and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. To our surprise, we've gotten a number of requests from people saying they would like a way to help financially support our efforts with the show. So, if you are interested... We are relaunching a Patreon page, which you can find at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. Join us there for two live video question and answer sessions each month. You can ask us anything, suggest new cases for us to look at, or even offer ideas for new leads for us to follow. If Patreon is not your thing, you can buy us a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. Thanks for the interest. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at MSheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.